good afternoon and welcome to the eighth meeting of the Justice Subcommittee in Policing on Policing in 2017. Apologies have been received from Mary Fee. Our first agenda item is a decision on whether to take item three in private, which is consideration of the evidence heard at today's roundtable evidence session. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Item number two, next item of business is a roundtable evidence session on the role of local policing commanders. And I welcome all the witnesses to the roundtable. Uh, before moving straight to questions, I think it would be quite useful if we just went round the table and introduced ourselves. And if we start with me, Margaret Mitchell, Margaret Mitchell uh, Vice Convener of the Policing Subcommittee. Rodi Irvin, I'm the Divisional Commander for Lanarkshire Division. Ben McPherson, MSP for Edinburgh Northern and Leith. Good afternoon, folks. I'm David McIntosh. I'm the Local Area Commander for Angus and Tayside. I'm also the Chair of the Violence Against Women Partnership in Angus and Vice Chair of the Integrated Children's Services Group in Angus. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gavin Russell, Chief Inspector, Q Division. Uh, until March, I was the local area commander for Coatbridge, Airdrie, Cumbernauld and Coalsyth. I uh, just recently moved to a service delivery job, still within Q Division. I'm Liam MacArthur, the MSP for Orkney. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, the MSP for Bamshire and Buchan Coast. Afternoon, Derek Crichton, Director of Communities, Dumfries and Galloway Council. Rona Mackay, MSP for Strathkelvin and Bearsden. I'm Jane Fowler, Head of Improvement in HR at Argyll and Butte Council, and I have a role in the Performance Review and Scrutiny Committee that hears the police performance information. And John, would you like to introduce yourself uh, since... Uh, first good, good afternoon, John, for the MSP Highlands and <laughs> OK, we wouldn't like to leave you as a wee orphan. Uh, we'll start with the relatively the straightforward questions. Um, perhaps, yeah, and I thank everyone who gave a written submission, that was very helpful for the subcommittee. But perhaps if we could start by um, asking you to expand on the different roles and responsibilities of local police commanders and local area commanders, just to start. Who would like to set the ball rolling? I'll start. Right. Uh, defining the role of divisional commander. So yep. I'm a divisional commander, as I said, of Lanarkshire Division. So to give a, a bit of an idea of what that involves, Lanarkshire Division has roughly 1,400, uh, 1,450 police officers, about 50 police staff. We cover the local authority areas of North and South Lanarkshire, a uh, population of roughly 700,000 people. Um, in terms of my role, so the, the division, there's, there's me as the divisional commander, there's one chief superintendent, we've got three superintendents covering operations, that superintendent's responsible, responsible for operational policing, a partnerships superintendent who is responsible for maintaining and maximising the contact with partners, groups, local authorities, um, despite the fact many of the groups I actually sit on myself, but we actually have a superintendent to, to drive the, the partnership relationship. One support superintendent who looks after probably more our internal business and a detective superintendent who's responsible for um, reactive crime investigation and also public protection. Um, in terms of the split of the division, we have four area commands and each area command has an area commander Gavin was formerly uh, one of the, the area commanders within Lanarkshire Division, now works in the headquarters area, and each area commander covers a geographical area. Anyone else like to add to it? Because there will be variations within every, every force. There are. Um, the sort of divisional structure is very much the same, and I would refer you back to for some more sort of detail on that to my, my, my submission. Uh, Paul Anderson's our chief superintendent, so he's the local policing commander covers sort of three local authority areas in Tayside, Perth and Kinross, eh, Dundee City and, and Angus. And the setup with kind of superintendents and sort of chief inspectors are very, very similar. Eh, my role is the local area commander in sort of Angus. So if you like, day-to-day -day policing responsibility is kind of, is sort of, kind of given to me. Um, the chief superintendent will set the parameters to which I sort of work in, but I'm very much thereafter left to go on with it. A lot of work to do with sort of kind of partners, kind of local community and staff, and I probably split my time about 50-50 between 
um, sort of partnership work. Um, I've a vested interest to stay in Angus. My kids go to school uh, in, in Angus, and, and those sort of relationships can uh, um, certainly help. Earlier part of of this year, just to build on that, to get some of that information that that, that comes in, we changed our sort of policing model. So we have locality inspectors in charge of areas, which is kind of linked into the local authority. So there's locality inspectors that are dedicated for that. There are also um, dedicated community sergeants and dedicated sort of community officers to build those uh, kind of relationships, um, if you like. So I'm very much looking for, for their input. We, we were assisted, our local policing plan um, was something that we sort of developed through consultation. And if you like, the change in our deployment model was for uh, also what the community views, but also the yeah, what officers were saying. So if you like, I manage that. So the operations on a day-to-day -day business, there's obviously staffing issues and partnership issues, which you know, keeps me very busy. Okay. So it's fair to say it's a strategic lead with commander and then at area level, um, yeah. it gets down to the nitty-gritty. Liam? Yeah, just following up on, on that, you, you pointed to the importance of relationship, and I think that's self-evidently the case. And one of the things that we've heard is that in some areas, there's, there's a rate of churn in terms of, of personnel in particular roles. Is that something that that you're conscious of? Um, is it a problem that's maybe more regionalised rather than a, across the piece? Is it a reflection of the creation of Police Scotland and things taking time to, to settle down? I mean, I, I think if, the, if, if those relationships are, be, are to be formed, I mean, there needs to be some level of, of continuity. And is that something that's, that, that's a priority within Police Scotland? Ask Gavin to, to answer this since yes. he's just been Good, moved. An and one of the reasons we had this round table is I never go to Cope Ridge and see the same person twice. So perhaps your view would be helpful. Ab absolutely, Mrs. Mitchell. I'm quite happy to answer that. I mean, I suppose from a Q division perspective, Mr. Irvin's been in post for 18 months. Um, during my time as the area commander at Coatbridge, which was just under three years, um, appointed in June 2014, leaving uh, in March this year, um, there's been there have been three divisional commanders. Uh, I was the only, uh, clearly the only area commander during that three-year period. The reason I moved on was quite simply personal development. You know, um, three years in post, um, probably one of the longest-serving area commanders, um, certainly in, in, in Q division. Uh, during that time, um, but certainly my own uh, reasons were personal development. For no other reason, um, was there anything else behind it? Is there a downside to that, though? You know, we're looking at continuity, and it also helps if you you know in depth. And it takes a little while to get up to speed. Too, I would imagine in no, the new post. I mean, I, I, David mentioned the fact of his local links uh, to to his own area that he, he uh, works in, and I, uh, born and bred in Airdrie, um, so being appointed to. Uh, be the local area commander back in June 2014. As a local area commander for the town I grew up in, my family still live there, etc. Was, you know, a very proud uh, moment for me, and certainly gave me the advantage of knowing the geography, um, which is always helpful. Um, but yes, I mean, it does take time to get to know the local elected members, your your, your partners. Um, and build up those relationships. But I do think it's very difficult to quantify what is the right time. You know, if, I would say probably six months minimum to get to know the relevant partners and build those early relationships. And those relationships clearly build through time and, you, you know, probably become less informal um, when that level of trust is and confidence is built up in each other. Um, but then, you know, is, is two years too long? You know, what is the tenure of post? If you put tenure of post on, say, a, a local area commander's position, there will always be variable factors come into that, welfare, uh, reasons where that person might have to move on from the post, personal development, because if you're saying to someone, if you become an area commander, you must stay in post for two years. However, if you go and work in at the Scottish Crime Campus, you may only have to remain in post for 18 months and then potentially get um, promotion. Um, so there are those variable factors. Really, there's a balance, but three commanders, uh, different divisional commanders in three years. Before I bring Roddy uh, in, uh, I think, Derek, you were going to give your perspective. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, certainly from a local authority perspective, we recognise that uh, it's, it's absolutely vital that if we're going to establish joint working and truly deliver uh, local services responsive to local needs, that relationships are going to be key to that. Continuity is vital. 
clearly there's a balance. I agree entirely there is a balance between the professional development of officers that applies to all public servants, uh, and therefore we've got to strike that balance. But certainly Dumfries and Galloway is pleased to see that we now have stability, and that's bringing continuity. And there is no doubt in our mind that when we didn't have that, it was detrimental to the, the, the joint working and ultimately yeah. the public services we were trying to provide. Okay. And Rory, the, the three commanders in yep. the And if I can just talk about uh, Gavin's position. So yeah. I had to strike a balance because Gavin proactively approached me seeking the move. Um, and I had to give consideration to that balance because I knew that um, th there would be an impact of the change. I had to make sure that the replacement was the right replacement. And the, the chief inspector who's replaced Gavin was someone who had been a response inspector uh, at Cumbernauld, had the local knowledge to a degree, had some of the relationships. And had Gavin approached me perhaps after having been in post for a year or mm -hmm. six months and saying, yeah. you know, I'd like career development, I, would, I might have had a different response. Yeah. But I, I did feel in fairness to Gavin, he'd, he'd worked his socks off for three years and I had to balance the career development versus stability. Mm -hmm. In, in terms of myself, it's or the divisional commander mm -hmm. role. I think it's it's been an interesting journey, and I think I think if there's one thing that Police Scotland is, in my experience, it's a learning organisation. So in terms of there was a period of significant change at the beginning. Uh, in terms of my own journey, when we became Police Scotland, I was a an area commander in Eastern Bartonshire. Um, th there was a strong desire to, to share best practice. I was asked to go up and be operations superintendent in Tayside. So I hope, I like to think I took some of my knowledge from Greater Glasgow up there. Um, and when I came back down from Tayside to Lanarkshire, I like to think that brought some of the Tayside knowledge down. Can I can ask how long you spent in each post? I was an area commander for just over a year. I was the operations superintendent for two years in Tayside. Um, and I've, I've now, as Gavin said, I've been down in the current role for over a year. And in terms of the, the culture, I think Police Scotland was a massive change and it came with a lot of change. And I know certainly that you know, when I had the conversation about going to Lanarkshire, I was briefed, you know, we're talking, you will measure your time at Lanarkshire in years, not months. You know, do you understand that when you take up this job? And I do understand that. And that's nothing against Lanarkshire, obviously. That's nothing at all. <laughs> Lanarkshire is a great place and, and a great division, and I'm proud to be there. But what I would say is that the culture has changed. Yeah. I, I, we've been through, I think, the period of such rapid change. We're now in a, a, a period of stability, more than we were. We've learned, we've taken account of the feedback, we've We've, we've had the feedback, we've gone through the pain of a lot of the feedback around rapidly changing people. And, you know, Gav alluded to the fact that there will always be variations. So th th there can be illness, there can be promotion, retirement, personal circumstances, career development. I think it would be impossible to actually say, you're signing up to this for X number of years. Mm. But in my own head, I know that my role in, in Lanarkshire will end up being measured in years, not months. OK. I, I was going to perhaps bring um, Jane in here, because one of the thing is, do the how do, how do partner organisations react to this? And in your role in HR in Argyll and Butte, that would be a useful insight. Yeah, thanks. Um, in terms of the, the, the kind of churn um, of change in a lot of the public services recently, you know, there has been quite a bit of change. And we have had some change in, in policing as well in Argyll and Butte. But I think the nature of the type of service, the type of area that we have, and the services that we have to deliver. We've got 23 inhabited islands. We've got people across six different towns and various little remote rural communities. We all have to work together in partnership to make sure that public service is delivered. Therefore, the partnership relationships are already strong. So when you have a degree of churn with any of the partner agencies, as long as the partnership surrounding it is strong, then that change can be accommodated and supported because the, the, 
ground the ground rules for that partnership working are set and there's an expectation that whoever moves into that post will be supported into the partnership working so the priorities are very clear and we have all of our plans aligned as you would expect through our outcome improvement plans but it's not just about the plans it's about the behaviors it's about the strength and interrelationships and that joint commitment across services to be in, to be a bit flexible but to be able to jointly do what what we need to do for the people of Argyll and Butte. So I think whilst you do have people retiring and being promoted, we're not going to have we're not going to be able to control that, but we can set a very clear environment that sets standards for people who are new and coming into that that partnership in a new role and support them. So I suppose the only problem would be if there was a lot of partners changed and yeah. you know if one or two change you can cope with if there's yes. a, a huge change too much of a learning curve. I think you wanted contact. Yes, I would agree David. with sort of both both points there. But I think having the right people in the right place, and then those relationships are key. Because as well as all the change within sort of kind of police Scotland, local and nationally, and then within the partner agencies, that helps you moving forward. And I know everybody across Scotland will be looking at local outcome improvement plans just now and locality plans. And how does that fit in? What what does that mean? So if the relationships are strong, you can do that. And if I can give a uh, an example from Angus kind of, kind of recently, um, Child Protection Committee, Adult Protection Committee and the Violence Against Women Partnership and Suicide Prevention, like elsewhere in the country, are coming under one banner. Um, so that's again just kind of future proof it a bit looking forward. How how is that going to be better can achieved? <coughs> um, you know how can we give support to the vulnerable in our community? And so tying that all together, and we couldn't have done that without strong relationships. And also, I wouldn't be able to influence it from a policing point of view or a local point of view from violence against women if I wasn't involved in that. I think you're going to get agreement on that. So there has to be a time period on it, and there has to be that consistency. And if folks start sharing. Um, the objectives and priorities, like Jane was saying there from Argyll and Butte, that's the way to go forward. Especially since that's such a vast area with so many different... John Finney? Yeah, I, I, just... I, to say, I, mean, I represent um, a, a very large area, and the police start from a very strong position because they enjoy, quite rightly, a lot of uh, public support. I was, I was really wanting to move it on slightly, if I may convene, to the issue about local policing issues. Because people get um, that the benefit of uh, Police Scotland is coordination around organised crime, terrorism, the, 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 the more strategic level. But of course, people still are concerned about litter, dog fouling, graffiti. Um, and it is about that balance, about being able to respond to that. And, and, and I know there are arrangements with local authorities. Are you able to comment on where, where the priorities would lie there? Because, you know, very few people are ever in touch with me about organised crime or terrorism, but it clearly it affects all communities. Um, but a lot of people are in touch about litter and graffiti and things like that. Roddy? Um. I think... I certainly feel, as a divisional commander, and I would like to think that my area commanders have created an environment where my area commanders have the local flexibility to address local issues. So, in, in terms of myself, I have... I go to, I'm not at the moment because of the, the sort of electoral situation, but traditionally I would go to a surgery with councillors um, from North and South Lanarkshire. I do that on a weekly basis. And we just, part of it for me is to gauge the, the health of the relationship, make sure that the councillors are, are able to have a voice to speak to me about how things are going well. And also, I'm a big believer in relationships, not transactions. We shouldn't be just executing transactions over and over again. We should be building relationships, trust, the kind of thing where you pick up a phone, you don't write a letter type thing. Um, and there's probably, I think the way policing is at its best when we do a mix of what people want and what people need. So traditionally, you know, when we consult, we're quite often told about disorder. Um, volume, you know, it, it could be dog fouling, it could be vandalism, it could be the, the quality of life, things which have a major impact on people's lives. Um, I remember I lived in a housing estate where there was a play park in the middle of it and local youths were using it to drink and be sick and kids were going out the next day and there was all these wonderful facilities and they were covered in sick and that has an impact. So we take that very seriously. And on top of that, we probably have to, very seldom when we consult in public, will people tell us that 
perhaps um, domestic abuse is a priority because these are not the things that people are discussing openly. And as a result, that's where we have to almost put a layer of professional knowledge on top. And I think, I think now, I, again, I go back to this. I don't think we're the same Police Scotland we were a few years ago. I think we're a different Police Scotland. I certainly feel it in terms of that local flexibility in a, a variety of ways. Um, just this week, we changed our operating model within Lanarkshire. And we changed that um, we changed that based on demand analysis. We changed it based on speaking to our cops to work out you know, what was impacting on their morale, etc. And with local consultation, and when I say local consultation, I don't necessarily mean formal consultation, I mean the stuff that's coming through area commanders, through area inspectors, to me from constant conversations with the public partners, local elected members, and also from what I hear in the, the surgery. And what was quite interesting was we did an awful lot of technical work. We did an awful lot of having conversations with our own people and other people. And I built up a, a strong case for why our current operating model wasn't optimal and why I wanted to move to this new proposal. And I found it a very easy sell. I went to the exec and I said, I want to propose a change in operating model. It will meet our geographical demand. It will meet our temporal demand. It will meet what the public are telling us they want. And I was told words similar, if I summarise to, well, you know what's going on in your division. You're speaking to your people. It's your division. You do that. And another example might be um, a lot of the local police plans, the three-year plans, are due to be refreshed early in the year. The LOIP, we actually, in consultation with our partners, the local outcome improvement plans were due to be published in October. And it didn't make any sense to us to publish our local police plan early in the year and then, I don't know, try and sort of cram it into the overall. So we said to Police Scotland, if you like, can we delay our local outcome improvement plan? And they said, yeah, if it makes sense locally, you do that. So I would like to think that the, the area commander locally would be reacting to the public's concerns <coughs> and also being quite open about the fact that there are national constraints and also there are police professional knowledge pieces of work that we have to tackle, even if it's not bubbling to the surface in community meetings. Just to pick up on that point, you say that you think you're a different organisation, you've got the flex, but it was an easy sell to the executive. So why wasn't it before? What's changed? I think in the early days of Police Scotland, I think there had to be, to a certain extent, there was a lot of change had to happen quickly. I mm -hmm. think that there had to be a certain amount of command and control type leadership there to make you know, the last thing we could afford to do was for Police Scotland not to work, so the priority was to make it work. Um, but, but we're through that now. And we've also learned, I think, I think we were unaware of some of the unintended consequences of the way we were operating in the early days. Plus, we had no experience. Halfway through 2013, we didn't know we couldn't go back to years and years and years of a national policing service in Scotland. We can now. We have the evidence. Um, and we've learned. And I think we've all kind of grown a little bit in that understanding. I think people would probably say that was Scottish Parliament too. And I'm going to take the, the panel, um, uh, Derek, and then Stuart's next. Thanks very much. Yeah, just to build on that point uh, from uh, John Finney, I certainly would acknowledge that I think we've just uh, elected uh, 1,200 councillors in Scotland, and I think they'll tell us firsthand in the last few weeks when they've been canvassing the issues that uh, certainly matter strategically, terrorism, violence, public protection. The, the matters on the doorstep probably can be summarised, litter, dog fouling and parking, and uh, quite clearly they're important local priorities that have to be balanced with the strategic uh, longer-term concerns. 
I think what we're certainly clear about in discussions recently with Police Scotland is that uh, we need to have a, a joint response that's uh, both uh, of a, a speedy response and a quality response that demonstrates to the public that these matters are being taken seriously, because they do matter to people, and all our surveys demonstrate that they come up quite high in ranking of public concerns. So what we're embarking upon just now is very much a kind of ward model through our elected members at a ward level very much engaging with the public, with uh, Police Scotland colleagues, with a view to ensuring the, the council resources in terms of community safety, we can take a far more joined up approach, which balances the need for both enforcement, which is, is clearly a tool where appropriate that needs to be uh, used, but also education, because ultimately uh, the litter that we see across Scotland is, is wholly unacceptable. It's not been put there uh, by uh, public agencies, it's been put there, unfortunately, by the public, and therefore the, the enforcement uh, has its place, but education is vital. So the more we can engage with communities, provide that educational approach, but also a strong response, I think we will get public confidence that we are balancing the strategic long-term concerns that matter to people with the very local issues, as I say, in terms of dog fouling, litter, parking, certainly rank very highly uh, in towns and cities across Scotland. Okay. Um, uh, if, you, if you'd like to come in, Jane, and then I'll bring David. I'll bring in the witnesses wherever I can before members, because that's the, the priority to hear from you. Okay, Jane. Thanks. I think um, just coming back to the, the kind of unique circumstances we have in our Gailin Butte and in our local policing plan, it, it sets out really clearly, it's draft at the moment, but it sets out really clearly how you take those national priorities right the way down to the the, the local issues and the local needs. And yes, it covers education, and yes, it covers um, enforcement, but it also covers about 80% of the activities that are carried out by uh, Police Scotland in Argyll and Butte are not about crime. They're about responding to crisis. They're about responding to community needs. They're about responding to some of the issues like mental health issues, so where you've got people in crisis. And in in our police vehicles in Argyll and Butte, they have things like defibrillators and they have things like... Um, you, the, the local commander went out to Mull the other week and was expecting the local police officer to meet them. But the local police officer couldn't meet him off the ferry because he was away helping somebody with a crisis to do with lambing. So it's that being part of the community is really important. But it's also the educational aspect of it, working in our schools, in all of our remote communities, um, to let the young people know what the priority issues are. So we can take things like uh, the risk of drug enforcement or serious, linked to serious and organised crime, right from the young people in schools up to the national priori priorities and make it relevant. So yes, dog fouling, yes, litter, yes, parking are issues, but actually we can help to tackle the bigger things by taking a local view on the national issues. And that's again through really good communication and really good joined up um, planning. I suppose that's the demand policing that we've been hearing about and how that takes up so much time. David. Thank you. Um, it's probably useful for the committee to, to know. I mean, Angus is very much a rural area as well, very much a place of places. So knowing what the, the local issues are and, and how you get that information, I mean, that's an ongoing process. That isn't a consultation once every six months. And the deployment model that we have in place supports that. There are as many people don't stay in any of the seven main towns and, as in stay in Forfar, for example. So how do you get that visibility of your message and officers and of the partnership kind of out there? So that's why we have dedicated inspectors, dedicated sergeants, dedicated cops who are also involved in partnership <coughs> uh, arenas. I have an officer in my community safety hub that chairs a financial harm um, so a group that covers all of Angus. And we have banks, post offices and building societies who will phone us up every week and say, do you know there is a vulnerable person here trying to um, you know, withdraw money out of their account? And I can maybe share some of that information sort of later on. But the local issues are vitally important because if you ask somebody from Forfa, they stay in Forfa, they don't stay in Angus. So I can relate very much to some of the stuff from Argyle and Butte. So geography becomes an issue. I've worked in a city environment, so how do you do it? So it's on a daily basis that we are speaking to our communities. I mean, our officers also attend the community subsidies, and we put a report ahead of that as well. And I think some of the, the best evidence of how that will go be some of the councillors and members here and how they feel that that engagement is. And because these are, these are real issues. But to go back to, to one earlier on this year, and, and you'll have seen it in the in the paper, there were five individuals from Liverpool who got the best part of 80 to 100 years for stealing 
a kind of cash machine in Carnoustie. Now, that was local crime and local issues that was affecting our growth in Carnoustie. These individuals who were travelling, and that was national resources that dealt with that. We couldn't have dealt with that previously. So it's getting, it is right, it's getting that balance. And being part of that partnership and that conversation towards what the locality plans will be underneath the sort of the loips when it comes through, and being, having, being in a facility to be able to support that, it's, it's good stuff. I think you cover a really important bit with the communication, you know, getting however that works if it's through banks, and, and that's intelligence gathering too. Yes. Roddy, and then Stuart, you're definitely coming in after this. I, do, I think as well, you know, I'll probably repeat the phrase a learning organisation, and we've already started learning from our 2026 consultation. So we used to talk about our approach to local policing. Now we're talking about our approaches to local policing and we're, we're recognising that there's... I think we used to talk about urban and rural and I think there's more to it than that and we've recognised. So we're now talking about urban, rural and remote. And actually I spoke to the commander of uh, Argyll and Butte about some of these remote island communities and the same thing came up where we were talking about this vehicle that seemed to have a a ladder, a hose, a stretcher, a defibrillator, a set of handcuffs, and I was just left with this vision of a Thunderbird-type thing out there. And that that's good learning for me, because in, in Lanarkshire, we're typically thought of as an urban division, but the south of South Lanarkshire particularly is very rural. And actually one of our big priorities came out around rural crime. And that, actually, that, that won an excellence award for our approach to rural crime. But I wouldn't necessarily say we are remote in the same way and face some of the challenges that probably are Gail and Butte and maybe the, some of the areas in the north. So it's, it's recognising that. And I think, I think we are learning all the time. Gavin's been waiting again. Do you mind, Stuart? Yeah. Gavin. Yeah, it's just really to, I suppose, address the, the view from me as an area commander in my relationship with, uh, you know, Roddy and as my, as my commander. That, uh, and how that then links up nationally. I certainly never felt in any way hamstrung as an area commander by national uh, priorities. I certainly had to make sure that I was enforcing and driving the national priorities um, and linking them in with our local priorities. But in no way did I feel hamstrung at all by national or the commander. You know, I absolutely have an absolute responsibility to... Um, you know, say drive local priorities, but actually for me, the really important thing was to drive the really local priorities, you know, that Mr Finney's um, talking about. So, for example, in Airdrie, that was absolutely parking, you know, uh, and it wasn't an issue I had anywhere else in any, to the great degree I had it in Airdrie, but Airdrie Town Centre and roundabout Monklands Hospital, we were continually getting complaints from members of the community and uh, that's an ongoing process. It's in no way solved. Um, we've done a lot of work with roads, a lot of work with uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue around actually you know, trying to demonstrate to people you know, we cannot get a fire truck down this street. And we've done a lot of engagement with uh, the, the local media, etc. But, you know, it's just really just to reinforce that, you know, um, I ab also absolutely felt a total autonomy to run my area as I saw fit. And if my priority at that particular day was parking, then it was parking. OK, so Stuart. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, our divisional commander talked about local flexibility. That's fine. Our two area commanders have talked about the need to do things in a way locally that responds to local needs. And I think that's all self-evident. What I'm interested in probing is with that diversity of response, which is appropriate to local needs, how do we deliver consistency of outcomes? Um, you know, are we all doing as well in the different areas? And I'm thinking of area commanders perhaps rather than divisional. Um, and in particular, given there's quite a lot of area commanders, how are you learning from each other? Is there a formal structure? How does that work? Uh, is there further development to take place uh, from what you can learn from each other? Because we've heard of a learning organisation. That poses quite a lot in how you measure outcomes to... Um, oh, I'm not trying to do things? that. Yeah? <laughs> Gavin? Without specifically addressing outcomes, so to speak, but, you know, Mr uh, Irvin spoke about a learning organisation and, uh, you know, certainly we are... Um, improving in that regard. Certainly, you know, from a local perspective, we have four uh, subdivisions, there's four area commanders and crew divisions. We certainly learn from each other. 
um, and best practice and what we are doing in each of our areas and, and as a management team you know, we'll sit around the table once for once a month formally to uh, for our tasking senior management team and that is an absolute opportunity for us to share you know the, the practice that we're, we're doing in our own areas do, do forgive me i understand that yes i'm more thinking of how you in lanarkshire are learning from just for the sake of argument someone in orkney the, the way I would link into that is not certainly not directly from Orkney. I mean, my link into that would be through uh, Roddy and through the the commanders, and you know he attends West Commanders meeting, he, he attends the Force Commanders meeting. So that's an opportunity for that sharing of best practice. But actually, no specifically. I mean, David and I have no link as area commanders. So, so just therefore to turn to a divisional commander, the the learning at senior levels is essentially therefore at divisional commander level, the exchange of information, be it formal or informal, because it's often round the water cooler that you hear the most interesting stories. The, and it's probably worthwhile bringing in the, the rank of superintendent yes. who, who isn't represented here. So for example, when I was the operator, I, I suppose the flip side of what we talked about with the rapid change, one of the benefits of the rapid change, if there was some, was rapid learning. So before Police Scotland, we would never have sat in a situation where the three of us had worked together. I left Glasgow, as I said, went up to Tayside, worked with David, and actually there was a particular situation in Dundee where a certain area was experiencing a chronic problem and I'd seen exactly the same chronic problem and we'd put together an action plan in Glasgow which tackled the problem. We were talk we always talk about this when we meet up because we're, we're both quite proud of what we did there and we built that action plan and it had similar success in Dundee. So there is an informal network of learning but one area perhaps if we talk about the superintendent, so our operations superintendent is our representative on the National Domestic Abuse Forum. And that's where the operations superintendents who have responsibility within divisions for the effective tackling of domestic abuse come together, come together with third, uh, third sector, assist women's aid, and they have a forum um, whereby they hold a divisional forum and they gather up their issues and their learning. And then they take it to the national forum and then all the operations <laughs> superintendents with representation from partners, third sector, would come together to share that learning. And I suppose one thing as well is that there have been significant, sticking on the subject of domestic abuse, for example, there have been significant benefits. Uh, another area of learning is we have, for domestic abuse, we have what we call MATAC, which is multi-agency tasking and coordinating. And what we used to do with MARAC was we focused on the risk posed to the victims. And we would come together, we would, in our division, we would have the highest risk domestic abuse victims. And we'd say, with partners, how are we going to make these people safe? We actually realised that potentially we were missing a trick because a good way to keep victims safe is to get in about the perpetrators. So MATAC is about focusing on the most profound offenders. And what was happening? before Police Scotland was where we identify a victim of domestic abuse, we'll go into our vulnerable persons database and we will look at their previous relationships. We will then proactively approach those partners and we will be uncovering domestic abuse we wouldn't have known about. What we are finding with some of these prolific offenders is that they are offending in various areas mm -hmm. around the country. So when we have our MATAC, which again is chaired by our operations superintendent, the National Domestic Abuse Task Force comes to that and can be tasked by us. So where, for example, you get uh, an offender who has offended in various divisional areas or there are various victims in divisional areas, the National Domestic Abuse Task Force will take that on and they will take that on as a, a package of work because they're the people best equipped. Now, the learning that we've taken from the National Domestic Abuse Task Force, because they have to come back in. I was the chair of MATAC when I was in Tayside because I was the operations super. And when they come back and they feed back about the work that they've done, because what we're doing with these offenders is we're just saying we are going to destroy your ability to behave this way. So we don't just look at them for domestic abuse, we look at them for disqualified driving, drugs, um, financial offending. And what we say is, 
you're hurting people, we're going to try and lock you up for whatever we can. The learning I took when I was in Tayside, chairing that, going into the division, the learning I took from Tayside into Lanarkshire and the learning that we continue to get from the National Domestic Abuse Task Force, and that's just one example, but there is roads policing examples. Can I give you a, a specific example? I think all of us, or most, a lot of us, saw the programme last night in trafficking. Mm -hmm. Now, how has that slipped through? It's rife in Scotland, and um, people are being trafficked two, three, four times. And yet, that documentary seemed to be un unearthing things that nobody was aware of. What went wrong? Uh, I probably, uh, I'm, I'm aware of the documentary, and I'm aware that a lot of the cases that were, were covered uh, were, were sort of from the Glasgow area, and I, I probably most powerful, if, I'm probably most informed about the situation in Lanarkshire. <laughs> but Matak? should be working according to you if it's... My tax for domestic abuse. Just domestic abuse, yeah. and there's not the same similar kind of um, approach for these other big issues, the like money laundering, like trafficking, like... Not necessarily. I mean, money laundering... Money laundering, I, I would say Police Scotland has a, a far better approach to money laundering than, than previous legacy arrangements, because what, what you tended to find with serious organised criminals is that... They were, they were potentially committing their crime in one force area. They were laundering their money in a different force area and they were living and spending it in another area. And to tackle crime like that, these different organisations had to come together. Now we have one organisation which can deal that with regard to the, the people trafficking. That is absolutely, I would say that's front and centre of our thinking. Certainly I can speak with most authority on Lanarkshire. Recently, we had a very major, large-scale operation specifically to tackle a situation. We'd, we'd been getting intelligence that we thought there was maybe human trafficking, human exploitation. We did uh, a major operation there. There was people were remanded as a result of it. From there, the, the actual doing the operation on the day was the, was the small part. It was following up with regard to the intelligence picture after that, and we are continuing to do that. We actually identified from that, we were concerned that there was potentially 15 Romanian people who had been trafficked, and we went out and we saw them, and we sat down with them when we spoke to them. And one thing that we're very conscious of is if you sit down and say, have you been trafficked? Then no. they, they probably won't say it, but there are certain indications whereby you can speak to them, sit, build trust, certain indications, which the presence or absence of will indicate. So, for example, we said, can you do us a favour? Can you go and get your passports for us? Now, if they are being exploited, it's highly unlikely they will, they'll be able to lay their hands on their passports. However, these people were able to lay their hands on their passports. So we did digging on that occasion. We, uh, we were of the opinion that they hadn't been trafficked. That's, that's not, not I suppose what I'm saying is that that's a whole lot of intelligence there that mm -hmm. you think should have been spread to other parts of Scotland, so that programme didn't reveal um, all these cases in Glasgow and you know going on to other mm -hmm. parts of, of Scotland. Does anyone else want to come in and on that? Gavin. I suppose just expanding uh, Roddy's point, uh, Mrs Mitchell, I mean, I was going to give, you know, just that local example of where human tra trafficking has been a priority in our area, and it is something we're aware of, and I've no doubt that, you know, my colleagues in David's area and elsewhere in the country have been carrying out similar operations. Um, without giving too much away, we, we will have other future operations planned in relation to that um, in the Lanarkshire area, and, and talking from my own um, experience in Airdrie and Coat Bridge. You know, we targeted several premises, and there's been at least three operations that I can think of in the last six months or so, specifically targeting human trafficking in my area. So it is a priority for us, and it is something Have that. Have these come to court? Have they been uh, sentenced? Have they been charged? Uh, not, not to my knowledge, Mrs. Mitchell. I mean, primarily, you know, the. 
the, what would be the hold up then? The, the driver for us certainly knows is to, is to safeguard people and to make sure those people are safe. And then obviously, if there's criminality, which clearly there is in the background, and I saw part of that programme myself last night, and there's clearly organised crime sitting behind it, both uh, organised crime in Scotland and elsewhere in, in Europe. And I've absolutely no doubt um, that my colleagues at the Scottish Crime Campus uh, are linking in with their colleagues across Europe uh, in relation to that. I, I suppose the problem is, though, um, we're not aware of any convictions. So therefore, um, it's hit the awareness, public awareness, from a documentary, not from the ethers of national or local policing. And just to use that example, surely that must be a concern. John, you wanted to come in. I'm aware um, Ben and Rona won't ha yeah. have to come in too. But I didn't know if it was at that point particularly, Rona, no, or Ben. Uh, yeah. no. No. Okay. Yeah, I'm conscious the police officers have been very open with us and, and, and there are certain areas where I'm sure that it, it's inappropriate to comment. It was to pick up more on the interagency because you'll recall, convener, uh, you and I are, I think, the only members of the last Justice Committee and we did do work on this and I remember hearing from a local authority worker in Edinburgh and it was, it, it, it was getting everyone to understand the potential signs. So I was just wondering, I don't know if any of our uh, community representatives mm -hmm. talk, h how that, that filters down and is there education? Because it is about um, the signs and symptoms that there may have been trafficking. If, um, and that would be evidence, I would have thought, of local cooperation on the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that, that you could add to either Jane or Derek from your point? Is it something that's crossed your radar at all, local information? Any sign at all? Multi-occupancy? Some strange going? People yeah. not where they're supposed to be? C certainly wouldn't be in the position to give a lot of detail, but certainly to reassure uh, the, the, the committee that there is joint working on this issue in Dumfries and Galloway, and you'll appreciate particularly given our location in two borders, both in terms of Scotland and England border, as well as the Northern Ireland border, it is an important issue, and reassure the member that there, there is joint working uh, in place uh, in relation to this issue, because it's quite a, a controversial and the uh, issue of concern, and uh, certainly could provide more details in a written form if that was helpful. Could, it, could I just ask, Derek, perhaps a tiny wee thing? Is this just about conviction, or is it about protecting people where it may not be possible to get convictions? Yes, uh, primarily, absolutely about protection, yes. Mm -hmm. and where, where it's about conviction, it's about protecting people. Yeah. Uh, using conviction as a, as a device. Mm -hmm. Jane? Yeah, um, again, not, not any, in any particular detail, but, but certainly the work that we do, the multi-agency work that, that we're involved in, as well as the local authority um, through the serious and organised crime groups, through the counter-terrorism group as well, you know, where there's just like intelligence about our activity, it raises awareness. And our work with the police um, through uh, the... It's back to relationships, actually. So when you're looking at issues, people are aware of issues around domestic abuse. People are aware of issues around serious, the potential for serious and organised crime and are making those connections, raising awareness in the communities, raising awareness through the schools as well. Um, it means that where there are, uh, where we have officers out in the community, whether they're in, working in health and social care, uh, whether they're working in trading standards, whether they're working um, in our kind of community community policing, community, um, community action, community protection stuff, then if they know the signs to look out for, they can raise awareness. And the strong relationships that we have across the partnerships mean that they can pick up the phone. It's not about memos. It's not about reporting to a committee. It's picking up a phone saying, I'm a bit concerned about this person that's just moved into this particular area or that's just registered with us for antenatal care or who has just come on our radar with children who the teacher's a little bit concerned about. So the awareness of something like people trafficking, whilst we don't have specific evidence from Argyll and Butte, or I'm not aware of in Argyll and Butte. It's about that awareness and making sure that people have their radar switched on and know the, the avenue to pick up and know to talk to their partners. I think I understand that perfectly, um, protection, but there must be prevention too. And if this is someone's being trafficked two, three, four times, then arguably you're, you're, you're maybe uh, getting on top of it once, you're tipping them off, they're moving on, but it's still going on there. Somewhere, surely, this has to be brought to the forefront and an example made so that it deters others. So there's a deterrent <coughs> as well, the prevention obviously being the very best solution rather than protection, which is after the effect. <coughs> There is national work planned, although I can't go into to too much detail. I suppose to, to build on Jane's point there, um, 
the, the multi-agency approach is very important. The community planning partnership, I, having conversations with fire colleagues who do home visits and who traditionally going back a number of years. I think we understand all that, and you, you've emphasised that, Roddy, but it was just how we move on to, to getting a concrete that's going to deter people. But move on. Ben, you had a question. Thank you. Just touching on some of the, the points that were raised earlier, I, I can only speak from a, an urban perspective because of um, the area that I represent, but certainly in, in both North Edinburgh and Leith very strong and stable relationships with uh, local commanders and um, inspectors. And part of the, the strength of, of Edinburgh's locality model, but also the fact that we have uh, absolutely allocated community police officers mm -hmm. that can then go in and build relationships. And that's actually been strengthened uh, within the area I represent and across the city. And I just wondered if uh, you wanted to touch on further about the importance of community representation and, and, and that ability to go out into the community, uh, as well as build relationships with elected members like myself so that we can and feed information, but to, to really reach out not just to uh, organised entities like community councils uh, or local institutions, but to, to really get into the community and, and speak to individuals face to face. Yeah. If we move to the, the new operating model that I mentioned. One of the, the key components was feedback that I would probably say that whilst our community policing model had been correct when it had been implemented a while ago. Things had moved on, and one of the pieces of feedback that we got was our community police officers were, you know, regularly changing, being taken away to deal with response. So we've moved to a model whereby there will be a dedicated ring-fenced group of community police officers. We've been putting out on traditional media, social media, their names. Um, I, I think I think there's a, a psychological importance to being there because. I am being open, and what we were finding sometimes was one officer was attending a community meeting and taking feedback and taking those issues away, and it was a different, different officer attending the next time, and they maybe weren't as cited as they could be on the issues that had been raised. If it's the same person over and over, just personal pride will kick in. Once you build up the relationships with the local community and they tell you they're having problems, if you have relationships there, it is important to you. And then your professional pride kicks in, because if you say, I'll do something about that for you, and then you personally go back, you are personally motivated to come back with a positive solution, because you've got to look these people in the eyes. And we have certainly, speaking in Lanarkshire, we've moved to a model whereby our new model will be far more geared towards that than the model we had previously. Okay. Gavin, then David. Yes, uh, thanks, Mr. Mitchell. I mean, that was a, a big frustration for me as a local area commander uh, around my ability to, to deliver effective community policing, because there's absolutely no doubt that uh, the old model uh, that we had wasn't allowing my community police officers, who a lot of them, in truth, were community police officers in name only, and weren't you know, because of the call demand and the, and the way the, uh, the resources were deployed, weren't being allowed to do that community focused work and certainly as Roddy says the, the new model we've moved to I now have or certainly the local area commanders now have dedicated absolutely truly dedicated community police officers and a big part of their work and only launched on Tuesday they're a big part of their work certainly over the next couple of weeks is to get out there and get themselves known in the community you know and, and, and tell people I am your community police officer you know whether that's you know, get into the schools, the youth groups, the um, the health centres, whatever it needs to be. Um, and I've seen some stuff uh, on our Twitter feed in the last couple of days, a, a couple of our, our local problem-solving team officers, and that's what they're there to do. They're there to solve local problems. Uh, and across the division, there's now 10 sergeants and 80 constables fulfilling that role. Um, and they will be left alone to do that. That is what we have signed up as a senior management team to allow them to do. David? Yes. When sort of staying in the community that I can, I can police, and as I say, kids going to school, they feel very much part of it. And people recognise me as my kid's dad, as well as the, you know, as, as the area commander. And reassurance to the community, to partners, but also to officers and families that you actually know what the issues are. So community officers is one aspect of that, but it's also how you go about your daily business, how you engage with people, how you go to, go to the meetings. And when you have that information and you have people involved, you have to deliver on that and you have to tell folks, this is what you've done, this is the benefit. 
I mean, the 2026 consultation that's gone out, gone out recently, as well as the 10-year plan, that's about differences we can make now for our communities in, in, in Scotland. So that's really important. So vitally important to have a mechanism that somebody can say, that is the person in my area. All my community officers stay in the area that they're working as well. It's the same model um, that the boss has got as well in, uh, um, in Q Division. But it's moving on from... It's moving on from there. So what is then going to be the next issue that you're going to deal with, whether it's the parking or whether it's going to, you know, what is the, what is the important uh, kind of issue? And again, we're coming back. It's that, it's that relationship. And if you don't have folks that can do that, you're not going to have that whole picture of the, the information. I mean, earlier on, people were saying about where do, we, where do we learn? How do I learn as an area commander? I learn every day off my staff of the members of, of the public when I mean, we go to kind of scrutiny and audit sort of committees. But also from an area commander's point of view, going to the police college, we all have continuous professional development type kind of um, sort of days. I go to days with the uh, Scottish Institute for Business Leaders where you learn from folks from industry. All of that is important. And if you're not out engaging, but importantly, you have to do something with that information when you're uh, when, when you have it. And yeah. that's that's key for me. And Derek? Thank you very much. Yes, I think the perspective from Dumfries and Galloway, if you'd asked us that question three years ago, would certainly have been a one of serious concern because, uh, quite clearly, the concern uh, coupled with the removal of the control room locally was that the, the accessibility and the visibility of Police Scotland was certainly seen to have deteriorated quite badly and uh, was a, a real concern uh, to the people of Dumfries and Galloway. The, the good news uh, that we can we can certainly uh, indicate today is there's been a, a change of emphasis in the last six months uh, for the better, and uh, there is a clear feedback uh, from our public and from our elected members that uh, we now have a community policing model that is ensuring, as, as one of the officers has said, that actually has dedicated resources. It's not a token uh, title that actually uh, doesn't follow through. There is now dedicated resources, and certainly our uh, commander. Uh, is, is very uh, proud of that change, and uh, rightly so. So it was just to reaffirm that uh, the concerns are well made, and it is something that, thankfully, the, the learning organisation has come through on, and therefore the, 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 the public, uh, who matter most in this, uh, are now starting to see uh, that difference being made. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to bring Jane in and then Liam, because I know you're um, short of time. <laughs> Thanks. Just um, in relation to that, to the community policing, I think one of the things that we've seen since the advent of Police Scotland is the clarity when we've, when we're now, because we're now responsible for the scrutiny of police activity. So we can see the activity at a local community council level where the elected members can interact directly with uh, the, the, the police who are on the ground there. And then we've got our local area committees um, with the community planning partners involved in that as well. So that's another structure with particular targets, particular outputs, and an impact from both communities community groups and from elected members into the direction of the policing in that particular part of Argyll and Butte. And then we come up to the performance review and scrutiny committee where the commander comes once a, a quarter and is there to answer to the performance of overall policing in Argyll and Butte. And in that respect, that's where some of the more strategic issues, strategic in terms of, of the area, can be raised and can be addressed. And the local flexibility that the commander has to address those issues built on the evidence, built on the measuring of the outcomes, built on the feedback and interaction with communities right up through that structure, really brings um, it, it brings a visibility to the, acti to the activities of police and it aligns them really visibly with uh, the priorities of the communities, enables elected members to input in, the, in that kind of democratic way and then can be communi communicated back out again to, to the communities overall. And for us, just, just to, to the um, last point, is that we had a real issue about the closing of police stations because visibility of buildings meant safety to some of our communities. Now, that's a real challenge when you're dealing with reduced resources and a lot of the buildings in our areas are not fit for purpose. So a change in priority, a change in resource and a change in the balancing of resourcing that the local commander was able to put in place meant that there was still visibility of police officers around about the communities that just weren't in buildings. And that really worked. It, it, was, a, it was a good response to a democratic concern. Liam? 
I, just following up that that point specifically, I mean, I think um, while it's been encouraging some of the the, the uh, reassurances we've heard, I think in terms of um, recent decisions taken around police counters or, or, or um, police stations, or indeed the withdrawal of um, uh, traffic warden services, for example, in relation to parking, I think those were pretty poorly handled, um, and, and I, I would hope the lessons have been learnt from that. It's more around resources that I was going to, to, to ask, because in a sense that uh, the, the, the financial position that Police Scotland's in is, is, is um, a little secret is made of it. Um, I'm aware in, in Orkney, for example, a very small force um, has been carrying a proportionately high number of vacancies um, for, for some time now. Um, and uh, in a sense, if you look at um, the crime rates, if you look at clear up rates and all the rest of it, it would be easy to see how um, from some some part distant, um, that that would not be a priority. But without a critical mass, actually policing an area, providing that community presence uh, around a, an archipelago of, of 20 inhabited islands and, and, and all the rest of it, is exceptionally difficult. And therefore, um, I, I just wonder how the, the case in terms of the resources that then the area commander is able to to uh, deploy a, a, in the way that um, he and the partners see fit is arrived at. Because uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there is a bit of a risk that, that there's not been much of a shift since the creation of Police Scotland and where the resources were before. Um, I, I think Ben might have a view on this in terms of policing in Edinburgh compared to the resources for policing in, in the Greater Glasgow area. But from, a, from a, a, an Orkney perspective, um, I, I, I think I have concerns about where that resource deployment uh, is and, and, and what area commanders have at their disposal to, to meet the needs through the, the mechanisms that I think we all um, uh, I think would agree are working better now than perhaps they were a year ago, certainly they were sort of, um, three, four years ago. Who wants to tackle that? And we'll have you, David. Yeah. I'll and go. I, mean, I, mean, I can say I can't, can't speak about Orkney, unfortunately, but I, I can <laughs> speak with some assurance on uh, Angus. With not wanting to go into too much of what my previous deployment model was in Angus, but looking at where where we are now, my real difference is in inspector numbers. Um, whereas we had an inspector that was solely based previously to the team, if you like, they, they, and that was them responding to calls. There was no ownership for local issues. So I have got less inspectors now. I'm more comfortable with where we are. So over the last couple of years, um, I've actually, if you look at the resources in Angus, I've got more police constables than I had before. And I can honestly say I've never had access to more national resources uh, kind of at all, which wouldn't have been there for me in Tayside. And I make the example you know, of the armed arrest that are both of the individuals. I make example of, you know, the flooding um, at kind of Forfar. I only realised then that I had the airwave servers for the whole of north of Scotland in my basement, <laughs> which was which was flooding, which was interesting. But the, the ability to be able to call on resources, not only police officers, but fire service from all around the country was, is vitally important. I've had officers from national groups, uh, violence reductions task force up at Bonfest and in Kerry Muir. There's folks coming up to support me at MoFest at the end of this month. So as well as looking at local resources and comparing where you were, it's not the same as we were previously. I, I know you'll accept that, but I have had access to more of these the kind of departments and more of those resources that can bolster it. And you have the flexibility to move folks, but you have to pick your priorities are what we deal with. Start with I think we all understand that that deployment of that, that national or regional specialist resource is, yeah. is, 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 is there. But actually, what are the levels of, of, of vacancy that you're carrying at any particular time? I mean, there are always vacancies from people going to yeah. move on or, or kind of go back, but it's, it's not high. It's also it's my job to make sure that you know if there is a vacancy that I'm looking for somebody else to kind of mm -hmm. um, to fill it. And you have support from our superintendent of support who looks kind of over that. And there is a constant churn of uh, young officers uh, coming out of the, the Scottish Police College, but also for the, the, the officers that are there, there's an importance in me. If I'm being given the autonomy operationally to deal with my area, what is our priorities going to be? What are our kind of community telling us? So if you look at kind of crime in, in Angus, I'm quite confident to say, well, I'm not going to say it is down. Crime across all groups is kind of, kind of down. So that, that's a good thing. And prevention is, is key. Where maybe we've been chasing the response for a while, and that is, that is important. Because, you know, if somebody... We think, how do you change a young person's life? It could be education, it could be that type of thing. But we're very good at detecting crime. So if somebody gets a conviction for something, they might not get that good sort of job opportunity or get to go and see Mickey Mouse on holiday. So it's targeting some of my resources to kind of prevention. So although you can have 
if somebody said to me, do you want to have more, David? I would say absolutely, but it's mm. actually what you're doing with them is, is the key is the key issue. You can have models of policing that are ineffective for now and sort of moving forward. And an example I give you, I had a, a really good conversation with one of my elected members recently, and they're saying, David, you're saying your violent crime is going down, but if you looked at that bit there, it looks as if it was one over. And it actually, well, it's not one over. What it is is we've had an increase in online extortions in relation to sort of young people and adults. Uh, and so that's where it is. So if you're looking again forward about where your demand is going to be, so our demand moving forward might not be the criticality of demand, it might not be the police officers on, on the beat, always going to be needed, but what is the demand to you know, the risk posed to our young people? And in 2026, you know, it looks a bit of like that. So the demand for police officers is constantly changing. So to, to think actually, are we happy now with what we've got? Well, we might be, but you know, where are we, where are we going forward? Did that answer your question about there, or did I? Yeah, I mean, I think there's probably specific issues in terms of recruitment and retention in in certain areas, yeah. and, I, and I appreciate the islands probably present more challenging. I mean, Argyll and Butte may have have a, a similar experience, whereas Angus is is perhaps less of a challenge in in, in that respect. But I think there's there, there is an issue that the, the success that's been had in keeping those crime rates down, the detection levels high, the the, the engagement with communities um, at the level that you would expect for a smaller force can only be achieved when you have a certain number of bodies to carry out the different roles that are involved in that. Mm -hmm. if, if I can, I mean, with the opportunity again, just for the benefit of the, the, the committee, I mean, detection rates are, are one aspect, but that's not the key thing. For me, if somebody asks me about performance, it's about the quality and the standard my officers are doing things you know, beforehand. I'm not process driven at all, but I like having things in place because then people know where they are, so people know where they're engaging with the community. So it's the standard in there. The detection rate, you know, as Rory was saying earlier, will allow you maybe to get some bail conditions and things in place, and it's an indication of what's going on. But that's the key bit. It's the work in between of what we're doing, what our priorities, and the standard and the quality of what folks going to deliver. That's certainly my driver. Okay. Um, Gavin and Jane, or was it Jane and then Gavin? Jane. Jane and then Gavin. Yeah, just quickly on recruitment, uh -huh. uh, clearly in, in remote areas it is, it is tricky. The Council, the NHS, a lot of our partners and the police in particular do have trouble recruiting. So, And when you're in a remote area, if you're carrying a vacancy, it has a fairly significant impact. But if you want to work in the police or if you want to work in social work or if you want to be a GP or a nurse, community nurse in a remote area, you're going to be living and working in the same community. So that brings its own challenges and you have to be a particular kind of person. So our local commander is leading a group in our community planning partnership to look across at public sector recruitment, working with developing Scotland's young workforce, working with the Argyll and Butte developing Scotland's young workforce, Skills Development Scotland, the schools, uh, the head teachers, and trying to create that impression of and create and share the reality of what it's like to live in an area like that because it is a lifestyle choice. You may young people may want to go away and come back again, but we have to be able to create the, the professional routes into jobs in the public sector that are challenging but are hugely rewarding as well. It's a real challenge, um, but I think we, c by working together again, coming back to my, my theme of partnership, if we work together, we can crack it. But there is a lot, there's a lot for us to sell uh, about living and working in remote areas, but we have to be real about it. And I think having the, the opportunity to get people who are li living and working there to talk to the kids and talk to the young people and also create a bit of, um, a bit, a bit of audiovisual content like you guys have done, like in Orkney has happened, selling the place is somewhere that is absolutely fantastic. And you do get to, as a police officer, drive around in the van with a defibrillator and a ladder and whatever else. Okay. Gavin? Thank you. Just to get back to uh, Mr MacArthur's point there, I mean, I, I clearly can't comment in Orkney that during my, you know, three years uh, as area commander uh, in the Monklands area, certainly there were times when we had resource challenges, you, not because of vacancies, but, you know, simply like any workforce through long-term absence, um, secondments, etc, etc. So there were challenges in, in specific areas, you know, maybe one shift was particularly challenged over a two or three week period. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, with regards to uh, vacancies, part of my role now is an HR function. And across the division, um, we have very, very small numbers of vacancies across 1,440 staff approximately with very limited vacancies and a constant, as David uh, mentioned, a constant backfill of young uh, or, or maybe not so young officers, certainly young in service officers coming through to us from the Scottish Police College. So, you know, they, they'll always be welcomed. Um, but, uh, you know, 
the national resource thing, I, I think it's acknowledged that you know we all get the benefit of the national resources, and yes, we all play our part. I mean, I'll play my part locally, and I'll give officers over to, you know, South Lanarkshire, for example, to, you know, possibly for a high-risk missing person inquiry. But in the same hand, I would expect, you know, that uh, to, to, to be reciprocated if and when I had a similar challenge. Um, and likewise, the national resources um, come through. We had a murder not that long ago, and it was it was managed by the major investigation team from the east who come through because the major investigation team from the West were engaged elsewhere. So, again, just to reinforce that point about, you know, absolutely we've all benefited from that national resource, but clearly we do have to play our, own, our part at times. And is there never a, a, an instance where there's several major uh, murder investigations and you're just spread too thin? Well, the, the one... Uh, uh, and it, the one I'm talking about where the MITS East come through um, to work was actually because the MITS West were working in our area as well. So, you know, the, the reason we were, were wholly unfortunate and uh, that we had two major investigations ongoing within the division at the same time, um, but that, thankfully, uh, for everyone uh, and, and no less for the community, is very rare. OK. Um, before we bring David in, Rona, do you want to come in with your no. question? My question has been answered many times okay. over. I just wanted to say to Roddy, I'm very encouraged by the model you're using for domestic abuse. I think that sounds, you know, really okay. forward thinking. But David? Yeah, it was just another bit, sort of, kind of locally. We're having a real sort of, kind of drive this now to try and recruit extra special constables. Because um, we have some real hard to reach community areas in Angus. I mean, you can travel for. 40, 45 minutes uh, north of Kerry Muir and you're still in so, Angus mm. and we have a large migrant workforce that, that come into work so you know that is a drive and our local community kind of sergeants and inspectors we have in place with the, kind of, with the, the same model we're giving them sort of, kind of some responsibility so we have some recruitment um, sort of events ongoing this now and we're looking to sort of, kind of considerably increase that and that kind of buys into the same sort of locality you can have kind of young folks might see um, police as a career or they just, they just want to be involved in sort of local community issues and we're kind of looking to encourage them that again support them with kind of proper training and then in, in the sort of kind of in the hard to reach areas they are going to have to be kind of advanced drivers especially um, they are going to have to be aware how to do lots of different types of, of inquiry. So we're looking to kind of harness that. Okay. Um, Jane mentioned outcomes. How do you measure a successful outcome? Now, it all depends on the, um, the issue. I'm going to put the trafficking up there again because that raised important issues about prevention and protection, getting that balance right. So can I have some views on, on that? Gavin. I mean, my, you know, David mentioned earlier about performance targets and figures, and you know we've been through that, you know, uh, over the last few years. But you know, in real simple terms, my, you know, is the community feedback. You know, what are the community telling us? Are the community pleased with the job we are doing? That's, you know, would be would be, uh, you know, my biggest outcome if that was the feedback we were getting when my officers go to. Tenants and Residents Association meeting, when they go to the Community Council meeting, when my uh, area inspectors go to the local area team meetings and so on and so forth, as we, as we go up the strategic community planning ladder, if we're getting positive feedback from, from the community, then that's telling me we're doing the right thing. Even though there might be something major going on in the background that hasn't quite been been tackled. I mean, because you're, you're talking to representatives in community councils, you're talking to going to a surgery where people are self-selecting to an extent. Just how, how much? I, I think the getting back to specific of the human trafficking programme last night, I think that was probably an eye-opener for um, a, lo a, lot, a lot of people in Scotland that that's actually going on, uh, you know, under our noses. Um, but, uh, and I say, our noses as in us as you know, members of the public, um, but uh, you know, human trafficking has been there for us for several years. There's a lot of work going on going in relation to education of the of officers and how to um, identify human trafficking. I, I, I'd be quite confident to say that you know, Police Scotland do treat it as a priority, and there's, there is has, there has been and will be a lot of work going on going in the future. And hopefully, the example that Roddy gave of the major operation that we had in Lanarkshire Division, that there will be, you know, you expressed some concern about uh, convictions. Hopefully there will be c convictions at the end of that and they'll be publicised and, you know, that will be reassuring to uh, the community across Scotland that Police Scotland are take taking that seriously and tackling the problem. 
Before I bring Roddy in, I wonder, Derek, um, if you're looking at communities, you're obviously looking at housing. That was a big factor yesterday, a big key to the whole thing. Is that in your radar anywhere? Yep, uh, it certainly is. Uh, uh, particularly challenging uh, Dumfries and Galloway, obviously a rural area, and uh, a bit like we're describing there, uh, very uh, remote areas, uh, and therefore not concentration of uh, people living in the remote areas presents that challenge in terms of housing. The additional challenge for us is that obviously we, as a council, are not uh, a landlord. We have a registered social landlord, so therefore it's that joint working that it uh, comes back to. So certainly can reassure that the members that uh, that's something we need to learn lessons from, but certainly we have a lot of joint working in place in relation to these issues, so we need to make sure these are tested, these are challenged and rigorously scrutinised, and uh, that's a key role that can happen nationally as well as locally. And if we give um, maybe Roddy and then Jane the last word outcome on that particularly, and maybe uh, how you interact with the Crown Crawford Acre Fiscal Service. It's been a particular interest to this committee and it must take up a lot of time, um, both nationally and locally. Um, just to, to talk about the outcomes very briefly, I think the local outcome improvement plans will contribute significantly it, in the new nature of the, the, the analysis-driven, targeted approach. I think, I, I think it's a very good question about outcomes because I think it is absolutely key because the numbers don't tell the, the whole story. We are very fortunate at Lanarkshire. Our Detective Chief Inspector in the Public Protection Unit is formerly of the National Rape Task Force, and she introduced this concept of where we saw concerning behaviours. I know I repeat myself just briefly to make this point. Where we saw the concerning behaviours around a domestic abuser who was exhibiting behaviours that did not indicate first-time offending. We've got domestic abuse. I think we've got that but, but pretty want, well done. But how want, did you transfer that to the trafficking, then? The, sorry, I didn't realise you to, were... To, it was trafficking, I said, particularly how do you measure an outcome there? Because domestic abuse, we seem to be on top of, as Rona said, then you, you've already outlined an excellent way and you've cracked that. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, trafficking's going on there mm -hmm. and we, we're not addressing it. It's a challenging question. How do we look at the outcomes? What we have to do in the first instance, I think, is we have to identify the scale of the problem. One of one of the problems that we have, to use domestic abuse, for example, just to touch on that, is we reckon that we're only getting reporting around a quarter there. So a good outcome there is we identify more and more. I think the same thing applies to the trafficking. The first outcome would be, I would say, to develop the true picture. I know that our Do we need um, more awareness of what are signs of trafficking? Yeah. Uh, is there such a thing that you can say if it's multi occupancy or there's coming and going? Are there things like that that, that can, the public can be made aware of? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, and it's definitely a multi agency approach because, in terms of the footfall in a property, the, the, football, the footfall in a property will not just be police, it's fire, it's local authority colleagues, it's schools, social work, knowing what the signs are. And I think the first, the first outcome would be to identify the scale of the problem, really understand that and communicate that. And if you'd like, I'd, I'd speak about the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal yeah, Service. From a, from a Lanarkshire perspective, we have two officers embedded with the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service, again, to build up those relationships, build up those detailed understanding. Um, our Detective Superintendent has regular meetings to identify and iron out any potential problems or difficulties that we're having. I now have a regular meeting with the most senior Procurator Fiscal for, for our area. And what we're talking about there is we have an agenda that we go through. Some of it's business efficiency, which is important. It's not about saving money, but it's about maximising our resources so that our energy is going to the end product, the outcome. But it's also discussing sometimes the priorities in the area. <clears throat> so if we are concerned about... So we had a significant amount of meetings. We did this major operation in respect of human exploitation, human trafficking recently. And the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal were front and centre. We had loads of meetings because we also wanted them to be cited on it so that they had the resources to deal with it so that we could all produce the most effective response. We also wanted them to have the background so that when they received pieces of paper, they, you know, with case reporting, they knew what the background was. And we do that quite regularly. We and the outcome from that, the two specific officers and that meeting and everything that went on was... 
the outcome is we've got people currently with regard to that operation who are remanded, and they, in the immediate term, they're off the street. They're not doing what they're doing. I would like to think in the longer term, in, in regard to that specific operation, I, I would hope that they would get sentences commensurate with what they were doing. And, and a lot of that is to do with that relationship building and that interaction, that proactive interaction with the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. OK. And last word, Jane? Uh, yeah, just very briefly. I think as long as we have... Uh, the partnership approach is absolutely, is absolutely vital to it, and I think we can use the model of domestic abuse, but a lot of it is about getting it onto the radar of the likes of the elected members and the senior officers who are responsible for driving forward a particular agenda, because as soon as we have trafficking, people trafficking, on the agenda as an outcome that's related to our local policing plan, then the elected members are going to be sitting around the table saying, well, what are you doing, Mr Commander or Mrs Commander, about that? And how many, perhaps the statistics will increase. So it, it, may, we, it may well be that one of the initial targets is increase the number of people who feel comfortable in reporting that they're concerned about somebody having been trafficked or that they themselves have been trafficked mm -hmm. and making sure that we've got the, the information and advice ready for people to share amongst the, uh, the different partner agencies so we all know when to act and what yeah. to do. I think this has been useful in um, just highlighting that much more awareness of this issue and the signs of it have to be there. I think this has been a very worthwhile round table. Can I thank you very much, uh, everyone who's taken the time to um, come to the committee and give evidence. I think there's a lot of positives. There's also challenges there that we've identified today. So I hope this has been a positive and constructive round table. So with that, can I move on to the next item which is a session in private suspend briefly to allow members of the um, gallery to to leave just go yeah